to worship you, to, to just be with one another, to open up your word in Bible classes, and now to once again open up your word. Help us to be those who don't just hear your word, but those who put it into practice, those who learn from it, those who allow it into our hearts and minds, even whenever it hurts. Thank you so much for all that you bless us with. Through Christ's name, amen. I heard my friend one time tell the following story. He said, there was one day that a Sunday school teacher was trying to drive home the importance of family life. She illustrated her point by referring to the commandment, honor your father and mother. And then she added, now that we know God's command, how are we to treat our, for how we are to treat our parents? Can any of you tell me a commandment that deals with how we are to treat our brothers and sisters? And so there was a long pause and no one wanted to answer. And then one boy's face lit up and he raised his hand very quickly and very anxiously. And whenever she pointed at him, he said, well, how about do not kill? And if you have siblings, you can relate to that probably. You know, this morning we're looking at how we honor not just brothers and sisters, not just our mothers and fathers, but how we honor God. As we continue talking about the idols that we tend to worship, we have to look at one of the idols that America worships over and over and over again and it's becoming more prevalent, and that is the idol of family. We worship the God of family in this country. And it's one of those things that we need to understand how we stop. We have to understand how do we keep God number one. I don't think any of us would deny that family is one of the best gifts that we've ever received from God. Whether that's a family by blood or whether that's adopted family or however you receive the family from God, it is one of the greatest blessings. But Jesus understood that this gift could become an idol that we worship. And it's an idol we do worship. You see, every good gift is great. But if we start putting it before God, if we start allowing it to get deep more than what it intended to be, it becomes adultery, doesn't it? Jesus understood this, and this is why he gives us the warning we find in Luke chapter 14 in verses 15 and 16. He said, Now great crowds accompanied him, and Jesus turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. There's a verse we don't like to pull out of the Bible much. Did you see what it, it doesn't say if anybody is okay. It says if, if you don't hate your brother and your sisters and your mothers and your fathers and even your own life, he cannot be my disciple is what Jesus says. Now this doesn't mean we don't love. Scripture clearly says that we ought to love, right? Jesus is getting at something. Jesus often used wordplay and Jesus often used common vernacular of his day and Jesus is making a very strong point what Jesus is actually saying when you dig deeper is not that you have to literally hate but that you don't put them above him in Jewish culture of the day hate was used to express a lesser love we do that all the time today you hear that oh I hate I hate that version of ice cream right and generally we don't always mean we actually hate it we generally means I uh, mean I like a different version more. A lot of times when we use the word, we do the same thing. Hate doesn't always mean the despise. It just means we like it less. And that's what it meant in the time of Jesus. Not every occasion, but they would use it like this. And from the rest of Scripture, it's clear this is what Jesus is talking about. Not that you have to hate mom and dad and that you have to hate your brothers and sisters. For it says you must love them, and it says honor your father and mother. Love them. And it tells mom and dad to love the children, not hate the children. Old Testament says don't go beyond what is necessary in your discipline of them. Right? He, they don't go overboard in it and stuff. Because we're to love, not hate. Jesus is not saying we're not supposed to love, but... He was discussing how we are to love Him centrally in our life. 
We love him more than our spouse. We love him more than our children. We love him more than our parents. We love him more than our friends. We love him more than our employers or our employees. We love him more than our Christian brothers and sisters. We love him more. This is what Jesus is saying. You see, if you, if you make family God, that means you love family more than Him. And God and Christ, all throughout the Scriptures, have said, that's not how this works. You love God and Christ more. And our love for all these others comes out of our love for Him. Scripture talks about this, how God will care for us, and how God is the demonstration of a good father and how if, if he will take care, if a good father will take care of his children, how much more will God take care of his own children? And we are to get our love for our family based out of our love for God as we follow him and his example. We don't put family over God, but we do that and we struggle with this in the world today and it's becoming more and more prevalent. God will not share the throne of our hearts with our spouse with our girlfriend or boyfriend, with our children, with anybody else. You either follow only God or you follow other gods. There is no and. It's clear throughout Scripture. God even says you cannot serve two masters, God and money. Well, that's true for everything else, isn't it? There is no God and that we worship. There is only God or only others. And the argument in Scripture is if you worship other things than other people, you're not actually a worshiper of God. So we sometimes struggle with putting God over family. We're not the first ones. Don't lose heart. We're not the first ones. Eli did the same thing, didn't he? If you don't remember the story of Eli... You're in luck. We're going to read some of it. Scripture tells us in 1 Samuel that Eli had some sons, and they were worthless fellows, it says, who did not know God, and they were very, very sinful, it tells us later. And then in chapter 2, verses 22 and following in 1 Samuel, we see the following story. Now, the story in and of itself is very interesting, but that's not the focal point. We're going to focus on the reasoning for some of this that God gives. And verse 22, now Eli was very old and he kept hearing all that his sons were doing to all of Israel and how they lay with the women who were serving at the entrance of the tent of meeting. And he said to them, why do you do such things? It sounds like a good father, right? Look, you are sinning against God. You are sleeping with people who you shouldn't be sleeping with. You're not married to them. You're, you're stealing from all these different things and you're not doing right. And so he starts out good. He says, why are you doing these things? For I hear of your evil dealings from all the people. Verse 24, No, my sons, it is not good. It is not a good report that I hear from the people of the Lord spreading abroad. If someone sins against a man, God will mediate for him. But if someone sins against the Lord, who can intercede for him? But look what it says. They would not listen to the voice of their father, for it was the will of the Lord to put them to death. Now, this is interesting because it starts off and Eli seems like he's doing the right thing, right? And, and he was. He started off really well in this. Eli was not perfect, but he started off really well. What Eli does is says, look, I'm hearing about all this sin, my children, right? And you need to stop it now because you are not sinning against people. You're sinning against God. And that is something that's a huge problem. And he says, you need to stop it. Yet, they didn't listen. Which, as a parent, I understand where Eli's coming from because I do everything I can with my children, and I don't have teenagers yet, so you know, pray for me. Is I, I need, let's see, I'll, it's still several years coming, but I need a lot of years of prayer leading up to that. Um, the truth is, though, even though we, we want to warn our children, this is really what's going on. 
Eli warns his children. And even though it's great to warn our children, we can't stop there when they don't listen. Especially when it's young children. He's talking about older children here. But especially when it's young children, we can't just stop just because they don't want to hear us. You guys probably don't have this happen, but my wonderful, loving, oldest daughter, what she does whenever I'm talking, she doesn't want to hear. And you know she can still hear you. (laughs) Right. And when they don't want to listen, you don't stop talking. But apparently that's the problem that of, of Eli. Eli did, because look what it says right beyond that in verse 27. Right after they said it wouldn't listen, they wouldn't listen to him. Verse 27, and there came a man of God to Eli and said to him, Thus says the Lord, did I indeed reveal myself to the house of your father when they were in Egypt, subject to the house of Pharaoh? Did I choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to go up to my altar, to burn incense, to wear an ephod before me? I give to the house of your father all my offerings by fire from the people of Israel. But look at verse 29. Verse 29 is why Eli's in trouble. It's not because his sons wouldn't listen. It's because of verse 29. Look what he says. Why then do you scorn my sacrifices? He's talking to Eli, not the two kids. To Eli, the man of God says, Why do you scorn my sacrifices and my offerings that I commanded for my dwelling? And honor your sons above who, church? Me. The problem wasn't the kids not listening. The problem was Eli not doing anything about it when they didn't listen. Allowing it to go on. Oh, well, but Josh, they were grown adults. What can you possibly do? Eli could have said, you will have nothing else to do with the sacrifices of the temple of God. Eli could have thrown them out of their service. To God. Eli could have thrown them out of the family. He could have done a lot of things. He could have talked to them more often. He could have uh, micromanaged their life. I don't know what he would have done, but the truth is he could have done a lot of things. And what the man of God says is you've honored your sons above God because you failed to do anything about this even after you warned them. Not only did he fail his children, by the way, he failed God in this. Why? Because he honored his children above God. He honored his children above God. Church, we may not do this when it comes to food sacrifice to God since we're not Jewish. But we sometimes struggle with honoring our children above God. I struggle sometimes. And some of you struggle sometimes. But we have to learn what it means to do that and how we we avoid that. Eli was worshiping family, not God. Verse 29 makes that clear. When we serve family above God, we put our love for and our allegiance to our family before that of God. So how do we worship God or family? Sometimes we struggle with a very similar situation to Eli. We know the sin that our kids live in. We know the sin of what they're doing. And maybe we've mentioned it in passing, but we don't actually take action, especially when they're within our house, right? When they're living within our house, maybe we don't take action. And by the way, the action is not throw your kids out. Whenever I was talking about Eli, that was drastic because that was in service to God. But... At the end of the day, when you know your kids are sinning, do you just kind of passingly mention it and then do nothing after that? Because that's putting and honoring them above God. Because you don't want to create waves in your relationship with your kids or or even with your spouse or even with your parents or even with your friends. We continue to let them carry on saying, I said something once, and that's good enough. Another way that we worship our family is by putting our spouse, our children, and others before God. Uh, And we do this by, we we can identify whether we do this by answering a few of several questions. For example, you can ask, who decides when, where, and if you will attend worship to God? Who makes that choice in your family? 
There's a lot of people that their kids make that choice. There's a lot of people that if my kid wakes up on the wrong side of the bed, we're not going to go to church because it's going to be a nightmare. I wish I had that luxury. There's a lot of people who let their kids dictate when the family goes to church and when they don't. And this is a, it's not new, but it's becoming more prevalent today, right? Who decides how you will worship God? Who, does, uh, who is at the front of your mind in each decision that you make? Is it, will this be best for my kids or will this be best for God? Right? Sometimes we make choices for our kids that we feel is in their best interest when in reality maybe they ought to skip that so that they can go do something for God and learn that it's okay to let go of something and let God take the reins. I remember, and I'm not saying that you can't ever take your kids to a ball game or something like that um, on a Wednesday night or whatever, but I remember one of the greatest things that my parents did with us is they said that whenever we were, we had teams and stuff, we had to miss stuff to go to church because God is who we worship, not whatever sport it was. And I remember having things where they would say, and Katie's had stories like this too, where they would say, well, if you have to miss this, then there's punishment or you won't make the team or whatever it is. And I remember my parents saying, hey, okay, I'm going to get the story wrong, but and she's not probably going to be happy I share this, but uh, Katie did gymnastics and she was able to, she was really progressing and she was going up to where they were looking at like the next level and whatever that commitment would be or whatever. And I, I think the reality was, if I'm going to get it wrong, Katie, sorry, but something about the reality and she never told me this. This were her parents telling me. I thought this was awesome. The reality was that in order to do that, she had to be at practice from this time to this time. And I'm assuming it was a Wednesday night. And if you missed those practices, they, were, like, they wouldn't let you compete or whatever it was. I forgot what it was. And Katie turned it down. And she went to another place to do gymnastics that wasn't going to get her a gold or whatever. I don't know. You can tell my knowledge of gymnastics. You just got all my knowledge of gymnastics. But, you know, Katie did that when she was a teenager. But a lot of kids won't make that choice if it's not modeled by the parent. The parent has to model who the God that the family worships is. If you worship sports, that's what your kids will worship. If you worship cars, that's what your kids will worship. If you worship God, that's who your kids will worship. By the way, if you worship your children, they're going to worship their children. There's nothing wrong with putting family first as long as we mean first after God. And this goes against our culture, doesn't it? We've got all the, um, it used to be the hovering people. They have, what is it, the lawnmowers or whoever it is now where uh, people are so involved with their kids that the world centers around them. The truth is, church, we have to center our life around God and Jesus Christ, including our family life. Don't misunderstand me. I take vacations, which means I'm not here. And usually Charlie or Paul or one of the elders will fill in for me. I'm not saying we can't miss occasionally. <laughs> I'm, my parents allowed me to go to some really big things, but it only happened a handful of times where I missed church to go to those. We're talking, what is your habit with your family? What are you thinking? Who makes the decisions? There are many other ways that we put God below our family. While it's often unintentional, it's still something that we have to deal with. If we prioritize our family over God, we create a self serving family who fits God into, into life if there is enough time. If we prioritize God over family, we create a family focused on God and serving Him. If we prioritize family over God, we create a self-serving family who fits God into their life if there is enough time. You see the difference? I said that twice for a reason. Do in your family, whether that's just you and your spouse, whether that's you and your friends, whether that's you and whomever you identify as your family, blood or not, 
Do you fit God into it if there's enough time, if there's enough desire? Or do you fit other things into your family's following of God? Exodus 20, verse 2 and 3 reminds us, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. And then look what it says, church. You shall have no other gods before me. No other gods. Family is a blessing from God, but it is never, ever to replace God as the priority and primary allegiance of our life. And that means that we have to make hard decisions sometimes that we're not going to like and others won't like. But it's because we put God first. Because we don't worship family. We don't worship our spouse. We don't worship our kids. We worship God. So that means if we're married to an unbelieving spouse and they're not going to come to church, we say we're going to go worship because I worship God over you even though I love you very much. That means when we have kids and they're not filling up to it because they don't know if they believe in God or not, we say, well... I understand the struggle, and many people have that, but we're still still going to worship God because we are a family who follows God. And when you get out of this house, you have to make that decision. But I'm going to set you up for success. Family is sacrificed to God, not the other way around church. Abraham is the most, besides Jesus Christ, Abraham is the most prominent picture of this. Abraham took his son Isaac, his only son, his promised son, the one that he loved, the one that he prayed for so much and so long, the one that God was going to bless him and his name with. And he was told to sacrifice his son on an altar. And as hard as it was for him to do, Abraham outright says, I know the Lord will provide, but he is willing to take the steps to sacrifice his son. Now, we know the story. God stops him before he does it because God says, I just wanted to know, do you serve family or do you serve me? And he says, now I know that you truly serve me, Abram. But he's not the only one. He's not the only one. In Romans chapter 8, verse 32, speaking of God, it said, He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he also, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? God put you and I above his own family, above his own son. He's not asking you and I to do anything that he himself has not already done. He asks us to put him above our family. When we put God above our family, God blesses us. When we put family above God, God curses. It's not because God wants to, it's because that's what Scripture says. Worship only God. If you love your wife and your husband and your kids and your grandkids and your parents and whomever else is in your family, if you love them, put them under God, not above. Teach them how to worship God in their life. God is a God who loves you. He loves your family. But he will be second to no one. He will be second to nothing. This is not a comfortable sermon series we're in on Sunday mornings. We're talking about the idols that we worship, not back in the day, but today. But it's a sermon series that God needs the church to hear. Not the world. The world doesn't believe in God. It's the church that needs to hear these. And so I'm stepping on my toes. I'm not stepping on it. Scripture is. But hopefully it's stepping on all of our toes as we reevaluate what idols do we put above God. And this morning, ask yourself, have I or do I currently put?
put my family above the worship of God. This morning, if you would like to begin prioritizing God by putting him above all things and being baptized in water, we have great news. We can do it for you right here, right now. But if you need support and prayers of this church, we offer that as well. We just simply ask, whatever your need is, make today the time that you choose to change. Make today the day that you make it. Simply come forward as we stand and sing this song.